you can see every component in that console. It's just fantastic. It's proper throwback to the 90s when there was all this clear tech everywhere. So this is a pair of consoles that I built for my friend Harley Likes Music who makes some awesome tunes with LSDJ. If you've not heard of him before you should definitely check him out, I'll leave some links for you to listen to in the description. So I did build these deliberately as a kind of matching pair. One of them uses black buttons and black screens around, the other one uses white. But I built the first one midweek this week and when I finished it, it was just too good not to share on the channel. So I set the camera up and filmed the process of building the second one. Now when I built this first one, I did find out very quickly that this plastic is an absolute fingerprint magnet, especially on the inside. You've got to be very, very careful not to get fingerprints on it because if they're on the inside and you can see them from the outside, you can't wipe them off without taking it apart. So when I did my second build, I used a pair of these surgical gloves. Now it felt a little bit weird. It's the first time I've done that with a console build, but it worked really, really well. I didn't get any fingerprints on anything so it was worth doing. So the donor console that I was using had the original front lit screen. It was working but it was worn and scratched on the shelf. So let's take a look at what we need. It comes with a bag of screws. These screws are actually pretty good. The buttons come on a sprue a bit like one of these gunpla kits so that's definitely a thumbs up from me. Now the button set comes with an additional cap to go on the volume slider but that is definitely something to watch out for because on some Game Boy Advance SPs, in fact on most I I've experienced that's permanently attached to the volume dial and if you try and pull it off you can end up breaking that particular switch so if it feels like it's not coming off it's probably not coming off and I wouldn't advise using the replacement part. Now I've usually used the Helder batteries which I'm a big fan of for the Game Boy Advance SP but this time I tried the funny playing high capacity lithium polymer battery and it seems really really nice it's got a injection molded casing it's got a custom contact PCB and the battery is really neatly soldered and connected inside it. The clear speaker is by Funny Playing and you get these in a nice little clear case which is handy for keeping spare screws and things in afterwards. And finally the screen kit which I have covered before. This is a drop-in kit so you can put it on any Game Boy shell at all and it will fit. The whole unit is self-contained. It does come with a wire which I didn't notice when I was doing the first build so I used some of my own wire. So on the second build I used my own wire again just so that it matched and it was quite visible through that clear shell. So one of the reasons I use the high speed Dido kit is that you could get it in two different colours. It's got a laminated lens so you don't have to attach that separately so you get no dust at all between the screen and the lens but one is white and one is black so that's why I got those kits. Now there is some soldering in involved with my build but you don't have to solder. There are touch controls on the screen itself to change the brightness and stuff so yeah if you don't want to do any soldering you don't have to. I just don't like really having this brightness button and it not doing anything but that's just me. Now I have done this a few times and I've got it down to a sequence that I find works really well for me. Your first thing to target is the hinges and to get to those you need to open up the console. So you use a crosshead screw to open up the battery compartment. I found there's actually a retro modding lithium polymer battery in there already but I want a matching pair across the two and seeing as you can see it through the battery casing I use the new funny playing battery on both. Once you've got the battery out you can swap to a tri-point screwdriver to open the shelf. Okay now let's just take a little detour for a moment. I have always called these tri-wing screwdrivers that kind of y-shaped screw that's just what I thought they were called that's what everyone seemed to call them so I just kind of went along with that but I've seen a lot of criticism of people recently for calling them tri-wing and saying that's wrong and I don't like getting things wrong so I went down a whole rabbit hole of reading all about all sorts of different screws and it does turn out that's correct a tri-wing screw is actually a slightly different shape so tri-point or tri-tip is the more preferred term for this particular type of screwdriver so from here on in I will be calling them tripoint. But you know what these rabbit holes are like. I also went reading about the crosshead screws as well and that there's all these different types. So I've called them like a Phillips screw, which is generally about right. Um, but on Game Boys and Japanese consoles, they often use the Japanese international standard, which is known as a JIS, which is a, a crosshead screw but it's an absolute crosshead angular screw without any slight curves in that you'd have on a Phillips screw. But I'm rambling. If you are interested, there's a whole load of stuff you can read about, about different types of screws. But as I say, going forward, just for the sake of easing any confusion, I'll refer to them as crosshead and tripoint. Now, this is a good mindset to be in. Just because you've always done something a certain way doesn't mean you can't change when you find out there's a better way or you've been doing it wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Anyway, moving on, there is a long tri-tip screw. It's going to take some getting used to in each corner of the console on the back 
and there is a small one inside the battery compartment and near the cartridge slot. Once you've got those out, you can lift off the back. None of these bits are needed now, so you can move those to one side and swap to a crosshead screwdriver for the rest of the build. There's three short screws holding the motherboard in place. Take those out, lift out the motherboard and remove the ribbon. To do this, you've just got to kind of pull back the two little clips on the catch and slide out the ribbon from the housing. Move all your buttons and your membranes out of the way, but make sure you keep your membranes later for the reassembly. I could have bought new ones, but there's a nicer feel to using the original ones, so in this case, I kept them. So the next step is the dreaded hinges. Definitely the best way of doing this is to just get that over and done with first, and then the rest of the build should be plain sailing. So to get to the hinges, first of all, you need to remove the cap by lifting the ribbon to reveal another crosshead screw. Lift off the cap, open up the screen. I used one of my 3D printed tools to pop the hinge out. You can use a screwdriver. Uh, it's a little awkward getting the clips out of the way. You need to just open up the Game Boy until it's at that point where the hinge just kind of locks in position. That is the point where you'll be able to slide those out. So I lined up the tool, applied some pressure with my thumb and it just popped out. You can then slide it out and move it to one side. It's, this is the right hinge that we're doing first. So I would suggest putting it over to your right. What I found is with the other side, you can kind of move the screen over to the side a little little bit until the hinge is not aligned anymore on the right side and then just pull it out to the left and it'll disengage from the hinge and then it's a simple case of just popping that one out and again put that one over towards your left then get hold of the screen frame and the control panel from your new shell put them on their side and look into the hole and you can just see that there's little bumps on the inside you rotate the two pieces until those bumps are aligned it'll be the same angle as when the screen hinges are open. Now the hinge will have caps on, you need to slide those off and put the new caps on. They came with my shell kit. So I slid those onto the end and then aligned my hinge, pushed them down and then some firm pressure from your thumb and it will just click in place. Flip it over, do the same on the other side with the other hinge. Test that it closes and opens properly and if that's working, really everything else in this build is pretty straightforward. So now to put the screen in place, you've got to peel off that protective layer before you drop it in position. You also need to loop the ribbon over before you feed the end of it through the little hole in the casing. The self-adhesive backing on the screen lens, I just peeled off the two bits on the side. That was plenty for what I needed to do. Put the top of the shell on, open it up and put the screws and use the screws that came with it. These are all crosshead, some short and some long in the bag. In this case, for the top part, you're using all short screws. You've got five short screws to put that together. It's new plastic that you're cutting into, so take your time, unscrew and re-screw if you need to, to make that thread nice and clean. I found the plastic's quite hard and the screws cut into it really nicely. I didn't have any problems at all with the screws. And in some cases I had to take things apart and put them back together again. And in that case, the threads held out really nicely too. After this, close the hinge, put the cap over the ribbon, flip it over, lift up the end of the ribbon and get one of the long crosshead screws to hold that in position. Now, attaching the ribbon to the motherboard is quite tricky. So it's best to just try and address that next before you do anything else. It's good to have something handy to support the motherboard because uh, a lot of the time you'll have it balancing up on its end. I used a small Bluetooth speaker in this place, but any sort of small box shaped object will do if, as long as it's got a little bit of weight to it. So it is quite tricky to get that ribbon in place, but I would say the key thing with this is patience. Take your time and I promise you it'll work absolutely fine. If you pull very gently on the end of the ribbon to try and get as much of it out of the housing as possible so you've got a little bit more to work with. Make sure that your clips are moved across from the little housing so that you can slide the ribbon in. Get to whatever angle you need to gently slide the ribbon in place and once it's in position hold the ribbon where it is and carefully try and pull those two clips at either end of the housing to lock the ribbon in place. Make sure they are definitely all the way down. What you'll find is sometimes you'll push one down and the other end will lift up a little bit and then you'll push the other end down and that one will lift up. Make sure they are both down before you release any pressure from the ribbon because otherwise the ribbon will just pull back out and you're back to square one. Now, as I say, there are capacitive touch sensors on the screen surround itself. So you can just tap on the actual console just below where the display is and you can increase or decrease the brightness but there is a brightness button on the console itself and if you just use that then you've got a button that does nothing and I don't like having a button that does nothing and I enjoy soldering you know I would advise anyone to get into doing that because it's a very satisfying thing to be able to do. So at this point if you are planning on soldering a wiring for the brightness control now would be a good time to do it. 
I didn't. I put my speaker and my buttons in first, but it worked okay doing it that way. The speaker just goes straight into the space where it goes. You don't need to do any soldering with that. It's a pressure fit against the metal parts on the board. There is a black dust cover on the original speaker, but with this new one being clear, I wanted it to match the shell, so that just went straight in as it was. I clipped the buttons off the sprue with my snips, but they will pull off fine if you're careful. I didn't do the volume slider because on this one, it is permanently attached, so I stuck with the original gray one. I laid all the buttons in place, cleaned up the silicon parts with a soft cloth and put them all in position. Don't forget about the light guide like I did on the other build and had to take it all apart again. You don't want to be doing that. It is quite tricky to align, but when you've got it the right way around, it goes in well, so you shouldn't have to force it. It sits quite flat and it holds in position. The buttons will stay in place if you're careful. You'll need to flip it all the way around if you're soldering after this point because you'll need access to the ribbon and the motherboard to solder the wire. You can use the wire that's included in the kit. The only reason I was using my own wire in this case is because I'd used it on my first build because I didn't notice that there were two little... Uh, wires in the bag. So I was using some blue Kynar wire, which is very, very fine wire. I did a little bit of flux to both solder points, one on the ribbon and one which is marked Q12B on the motherboard. I did a little bit of flux to both of those points, heated them with a soldering iron and added a little spot of solder. Then I aligned the wire, reheated the solder and held it in place for each point, after which I used tweezers to help route the wire neatly. Flipped it over again so I could lower the motherboard onto the buttons and made sure it all fits in place without anything straining. I put the three short screws into the motherboard. Start them off and then lift it and open the hinge so you can hold the control panel against the motherboard and put the screws in nice and snug. Now it's time to put the stuff together for the back shelf. I took off the battery cover and popped that to one side. So you want to find a little square metal nut that just pushes in position and that is like the other half of the screw for your battery cover. So that's really important to put in. It's the sort of thing that you'll forget about, put the whole console together and then need to open it all up again to put it in. So make sure that goes in place now. After that, it's time to open up the bag that comes with all the relevant bits for the back shell. Uh, one of which is the ground shield, which has a black plastic layer on there as well. And sometimes those holes might not be punched all the way through. And on my first build, I ended up with those two little bits stuck to my finger and then they got stuck inside another bit later. So if they are there, pop them out of the holes and get them well out of the way before you carry on because they just seem to find their way into everything. So you should have your shoulder buttons from your button kit, you'll have two springs, you'll have two pins and you'll have the ground shield. So there is a knack to getting the shoulder buttons in position. First of all, take a look at your springs. They will have one sort of flat end and one end with like an angled bit. The angled bit goes on the button and if you look on the button itself, there's a little slot so you can tell exactly where that goes. The loop part of the spring Spring, I suppose the spring part of the spring, coil. <laughs> the coil of the spring lines up with the hole in the button and then if you, I find it's easiest if you put the pin actually into the hole in the shell, lower the button in place and then use tweezers or a tool to just pull the spring around and it locks into a little plastic hook in the case. I've made it sound very complicated there, it's quite a simple thing to do and make sure you get the L on the left side and the R on the right side. Once they're actually popped in, they tend to hold in position quite well. Put the ground shield in place. If you need to figure out which way around it goes, look at the old shell and see where that one is. Use two long screws to hold that in position. Lastly, find the cap for your power button that will slot into the back shell and click it into the off position. Now you can carefully lower the back shell onto the rest of the console. Again, you shouldn't have to apply any force. If anything is not going, just make sure that everything is aligned correctly. It should just lower in position. And once that's in place, you can put your screws in. Again, you've got four longer ones, one at each corner and two shorter ones, one in the battery compartment and one in the cartridge slot. Now, originally they were the tri-point screws, but the ones that come with this kit, every screw is a crosshead, which is a little less authentic, but a lot more straightforward if you need to do any maintenance on it in future. I opened it up, had a little inspection, tried pressing all the buttons and everything felt pretty good. I put the new battery in place and attached the cover, fixed that in place with the screw and then switched on. And thankfully the screen and sound were working absolutely perfectly. In fact, it looked and sounded 
great. And now you're almost done. I did a quick test just to make sure everything was okay. The touch brightness was working fine and the brightness control switch was working fine too. Sound was good, volume was all good. And I loaded up a game and that was fine there too. Then you've got the finishing touches. It comes with these little tiny gel circles that push into the screw holes on the screen surround. Now they are not all the same. There are three flat disc type ones and two that are slightly thicker. The slightly thicker ones go up in these two top corners for when you're actually closing the shell they just touch in place here and here so you don't get any of the two parts of the shell actually in contact the other three go on the left and right at the bottom and the top in the middle they're not actually self-adhesive but they are a kind of slightly gel like texture so when you push them in they stay quite neatly in position and again like the rest of the shell they are completely clear so they look awesome finally you've got that nintendo logo badge which just goes into a little recess on top of the shell it's optional at this point whether you put this sticker on the back i did it on my first build and then when i came to do the second one not only was it a different color when you've got the cartridge actually in the slot without the sticker you can totally see the artwork on the cartridge whereas if you've got the sticker in place it looks like that so i think i prefer it without the sticker so i'm going to be removing it from this one just so that both of them match and that is it i have done plenty of testing with these synths and i just love playing with them they do feel slightly different it's a more glossy surface than i'm used to on a game by advance sp very very comfortable to use and it's just all you can do to keep your eyes on the screen without them drifting away and looking at this beautiful console that we've got here. But that's probably just me nerding out as usual. So I got all of the parts for both of these builds from Z Labs in the UK. They are a supplier of so much awesome modding stuff. You will definitely want to check them out. And if you do, you can use my link in the description, which will support my channel and also get you a nice little discount. So if you want to buy yourself some stuff to try something like this out, definitely check out that link. I'm just so stoked with how these turned out and I know that Harley is going to love them as well. So I do really enjoy building these custom Game Boy Advance SPs. It's really satisfying, but I know the hinges are definitely something that put a lot of people off doing these builds. If you want to find out a little bit more about the tool that I was using earlier to make it much, much easier to take the hinges out, then you might want to check out the video I've popped up here where you can find out how you can even 3D print one to use for yourself. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.